Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, open up our hearts and our minds. Help us to know the truth, love the truth, and live it every day. Lord, our church is suffering greatly right now. We pray that you uh, give us uh, a good and holy priest, good and holy bishops, and a good and holy pope to lead us all every day. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight's Catechism of the Catholic Church. And um, we're on page 62. Um, paragraph uh, 232, paragraph 232. This uh, section here is about the Holy Trinity. It's very basic. Um, I don't know if it's very exciting, <laughs> um, but I'll do my best. The main thing is, I think, that we read it, that we see what the church says, but I'm telling you, there are some paragraphs in here that are really hard just to even come close to understanding. I've read them over and over and over, and, and I'm thinking, what is that talking about? You know, so maybe I'm not the greatest teacher tonight. We'll see what we can do. Paragraph 232. Christians are baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Before receiving the sacrament, they respond to a three-part question when asked to confess the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they say, I do, to each. The faith of all Christians rests on the Trinity. It is true. This is the most basic truth about our religion. It's who is God? And God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is very basic. Paragraph 233. Christians are baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, not in their names. For there is only one God, the Almighty Father, His only Son, and the Holy Spirit the Most Holy Trinity. That is kind of, I don't know if you ever noticed that. You, you might think you'd say, well, you know, in the names of the Father, I mean, there are three persons, you would think you'd say plural, names, but we don't. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because there is only one God. And, and that is the whole thing that we really have to nail down here in this whole lesson tonight, is that there's only one God. Although there are three distinct persons, there is only one God. And he only ever gave us one name for himself. I am who I am. Uh-huh. Right. In the Old Testament, the great I am. But in the New, Jesus reveals Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, we had to coin a new word. Now we say Trinity, the Holy Trinity. That's not the name of God, but that is a word that expresses the reality of three persons in one God. Paragraph 234. The mystery of the Most Holy Trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. It is the mystery of God in himself. It is therefore the source of all other mysteries of faith, the light that enlightens them. It is the most fundamental and essential teaching in the hierarchy of truths of faith. The whole history of salvation is identical with the history of the way and the means by which the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, reveals himself to men and reconciles and unites with himself those who turn away from sin. This paragraph expounds briefly, one, how the mystery of the Blessed Trinity was revealed, 
two, how the church has articulated the doctrine of faith regarding this mystery, and three, how by the divine missions of the Son and the Holy Spirit, God the Father fulfills the plan of his loving goodness of creation, redemption, and sanctification. So, this section of the, they call it a paragraph, this section, the next couple pages, it, that's what they're going to do, uh, illustrate those three points. How, how this mystery was revealed, how the church articulates it, and how God fulfills his plan for salvation. Paragraph 236. The fathers of the church distinguish between theology and economy. Theology refers to the mystery of God's inmost life within the Blessed Trinity, and economy to all the works by which God reveals himself and communicates his life. Through the economy, the theology is revealed to us, but conversely, the theology illuminates the whole economy. God works to reveal who he is in himself. The mystery of his inmost being enlightens our understanding of all his works. So it is analogously among human persons. A person discloses himself in his actions. And the better we know a person, the better we understand his actions. <laughs> I don't know why this just popped into my head, but thinking about an example of that. Bill Clinton is a liar, you know. And then when he lies, you understand, oh, it's Bill Clinton. That's what he does. You know. <laughs> I think we could probably say the same for Hillary. <laughs> uh, a couple years ago, when the campaign was going, I put up a sign out by my house. <laughs> I hang one out there on the, I don't know if you ever go and buy my house. Oh, yes. I, I have a little sign that I change from time to time. So and, and, I, and, <laughs> and I simply, I simply put, she lies. That's all I put on the sign. Uh, it wasn't, but a week or so later, I saw a neighbor boy, uh, Xavier Flippo, lives down the road. He was only like 11 years old. And I picked him up to help me mow grass. And I said, uh, Xavier, you see my sign? He said, yeah. I said, that's all. That's, that's Hillary, isn't it? <laughs> Never said anything about her on there. It just said she lies, and somebody uh, must have taken great offense because they stole it. It was only up there about a week, and one one night in the middle of the night, it disappeared. Somebody stole it, <laughs> and then I put up a sign saying, "She lies and steals." <laughs> It, it stayed up. I really tightened the screws on it. That's why it called spray paint. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Anyway. They're not as smart. I, I, think you, I think you understand what that paragraph is saying. You know, our actions reveal something about us. Paragraph 237. The Trinity is a mystery of faith in the strict sense. One of the mysteries that are hidden in God, which can never be known unless they are revealed by God. Now, that's what the, um, they say, a, a mystery of faith in the strict sense. Sometimes it's referred to as a strict mystery. Strict mysteries are truths that we could never have figured out without God revealing it to us. So the Trinity is one of those things that just using reason alone, we would have never come to the conclusion that there are three persons in the one true God. Just using our reason alone, we wouldn't have come to that. 
a lot of other things about our faith, using reason alone, we could, we could come to, we could reason it, we could conclude it, but not this one. So that's why they call it a strict mystery. Um, just, this just kind of popped into my head. Um, Mo Moses, didn't he see the face of God? Let's just say yes. So, okay. So, it says he spoke with God face to face. Okay. It says he spoke to God as one man speaking to another. Mm -hmm. Just exactly how that plays out with God. I mean, did he see some sort of visual representation of well, that's God? My, that's or, my question. Because yeah. God is spirit. Spirit's invisible and you can't see spirit. So did God become visible in some fashion? It seems... It seems that God became visible in some fashion. Mm -hmm. But to say that's the face of God, I don't know. That could just be a human expression. Okay, second question. Yeah. Um, so, with them, I don't know if this is answerable, but with them being, you know, one, you know, Jesus came down on earth. Yeah. Did, I mean, he's kind of set. Separate there. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, is he still, I mean, is he still, I mean, are they, are, is, is the answer going to be, well, he's still one with God through spirit and not with. It is really difficult because as you'll see in the next upcoming paragraphs, yeah. they talk about the missions of the Holy Trinity. That you ha the, the Father creates, the Son redeems, and the Spirit sanctifies. But it also says they all do all things together. We speak of the Father as creator, the Son as redeemer, and the Holy Spirit as sanctifier. But the fact is, all three persons of the Trinity do everything together. Okay. So you really, in a way, you can't separate them because they are unity. And they are distinguished because they are different persons. Father, Son, and Spirit are three distinct persons, yet one God, one essence, one nature, one substance. These things are really hard to talk about and to understand from a human point of view. So we're going to do our best. To be sure, God has left traces of his Trinitarian being in his work of creation and in his revelation throughout the Old Testament. But his inmost being as Holy Trinity is a mystery that is inaccessible to reason alone, or even to Israel's faith before the incarnation of God's Son and the sending of the Holy Spirit. So what it's saying is reason alone could not come to the doctrine of the Trinity, and neither did the people of the Old Testament. They had some revelation of God, but even with the revelation of God and the prophets, they, they, they did not yet have the notion, the idea of the Holy Trinity. Although there are clues right there at the very beginning in Genesis. Let us make man in our image. Certainly seems like we're having a plural, you know, like we have more than one person there. But yet, the, 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 the Jewish religion was extremely monotheistic is what set every, set them apart from everything else. They were monotheistic. One God. They did not, and, and we are monotheistic too. We don't believe in three gods, but the idea of three distinct persons in the one true God, before Jesus came to the world, people just did not know it. The Father revealed by the Son. Paragraph 238, many religions invoke God as Father. The deity is often considered the Father of gods and of men. 
In Israel, God is called Father inasmuch as He is Creator of the world. Even more, God is Father because of the covenant and the gift of the law to Israel, His firstborn Son. Yes, in Exodus, the Jewish people are called His firstborn Son. Well, that kind of refers to God as Father then. God is also called the Father of the King of Israel. Most especially, he is, quote, the father of the poor, of the orphan and the widow, who are under his loving protection. That's from Psalm 68. So in the Old Testament, God was called father sometimes. 239. By calling God father, the language of faith indicates two main things. That God is the first origin of everything and the transcendent authority, and that he is at the same time goodness and loving care for all his children. God's parental tenderness can also be expressed by the image of motherhood, which emphasizes God's imminence, the intimacy between creator and creature. And we might stop and think of an example. Jesus once said, how I wish to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks, and you would not believe in me. So Jesus is comparing himself to a mother hen. Okay? So, but Jesus called God, I've heard some people take that in an incorrect way and say, well, we, we can just as accurately call God mother. No. Just because Jesus used a feminine uh, metaphor, a mother hen, he's talking about the love and the protection that that mother hen would give to her chicks. He wants to love and protect the, the people of Jerusalem, but they would not accept him. Uh, Jesus reveals God as father, though, and not as mother. The language of faith thus draws on the human experience of parents who are in a way the first representatives of God for man. But this experience also tells us that human parents are fallible and can disfigure the face of fatherhood and motherhood. We know that all too well, don't we? We ought therefore to recall that God transcends the human distinction between the sexes. He is neither man nor woman. He is God. He also transcends human fatherhood and motherhood, although he is their origin and standard. No one is father as God is father. Jesus revealed that God is father in an unheard of sense. He is father not only in being creator, he is eternally father by his relationship to his son, who reciprocally is son only in his relation to his Father. Uh, Jesus said, No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. For this reason the apostles confessed Jesus to be the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As the image of the invisible God as the radiance of the glory of God and the very stamp of his nature. Paragraph 242. Following this apostolic tradition, the church confessed at the first ecumenical council at Nicaea in 325 AD that the Son is consubstantial with the Father, that is, one only God with him. The Second Ecumenical Council, held at Constantinople in 381 AD, kept this expression in its formulation of the Nicene Creed and confessed the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial, with the Father. So, whatever the Father is, that's what the Son is. 
at the Council of Nicaea, they were reacting to uh, Arius, the heretic, who said that Jesus was a creature, uh, said that he was some something lower than God. And so the council fathers really hit it, you know, very hard. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Arius had said Jesus was created, that he was made. And they said, no, 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 begotten, not made. Jesus was not created. He is eternal with the Father. Consubstantial, and that word there, of the same substance, of the same essence, of the same being, of the same nature. These are other words for substance. We, we, again, it's hard to talk about substance when you're talking about God, because God is spirit. And the only substances that we know of are made of atoms and molecules. I mean, matter. But God is not matter. God is spirit. So it get, but still, we have to use human words that make human sense. And so we say that uh, the, the Father and the Son are consubstantial. They are the same essence, nature, or substance. The Father and the Son revealed by the Spirit, paragraph 243. Before his Passover, Jesus announced the sending of another paraclete, the Holy Spirit. At work since creation, having previously spoken through the prophets, the Spirit will now be with and in the disciples to teach them and guide them into all the truth. The Holy Spirit is thus revealed as another divine person with Jesus and the Father. The eternal origin of the Holy Spirit is revealed in his mission in time. The Spirit is sent to the apostles and to the church, both by the Father in the name of the Son and by the Son in person, once he had returned to the Father. The sending of the person of the Spirit after Jesus' glorification reveals its fullness, in its fullness, the mystery of the Holy Trinity. The apostolic faith concerning the Spirit was confessed by the Second Ecumenical Council at Constantinople in 381. Quote, We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. Unquote. By this confession, the Church recognizes the Father as the source and origin of the whole divinity. But the eternal origin of the Spirit is not unconnected with the Son's origin. Quote, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, is God, one and equal with the Father and the Son, of the same substance and also of the same nature. Yet he is not called the Spirit of the Father alone, but the Spirit of both the Father and the Son. Unquote. The Creed of the Church from the Council of Constantinople confesses, quote, With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. So, the Church wants us to know without any doubt that the Holy Spirit is God. He is worshipped, just as the Father and the Son. He is glorified. He shares the glory of God the Father and God the Son. He is equal in every way. All three persons are equal in every way. 246. The Latin tradition, speaking of the Roman Catholic Church, the Latin tradition of the Creed confesses that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Philoquy, that little phrase, and the Son, is called the Philoquy. And that is one of the one of the reasons of the Great Schism of 1054 AD. The Eastern Church disputed that. 
the Latin church, the Western church, said, no, this 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 part of the creed should be part of the creed. And the Eastern, the Eastern Christians uh, of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Greek-speaking ones, they did not accept that. They talk a little bit about that here in this part of the Catechism. But just so that you know, when they say philoquy, they mean that phrase, and the Son, that the... The Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. I think to this very day, if you read the creed in, a, in an Eastern Orthodox church, that phrase, and the Son, is not there. The Council of Florence in 1438 explains, quote, The Holy Spirit is eternally from the Father and Son. He has His nature and subsistence at once, from the Father and the Son. He proceeds eternally from both of from both as from one principle and through one spiration. And since the Father has through generation given to the only begotten Son everything that belongs to the Father, except being the Father, the Son has also eternally from the Father from whom he is eternally born, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son. The affirmation of the philoquy does not appear in the creed confessed in 381 at Constantinople. But Pope St. Leo I, following an ancient Latin and Alexandrian tradition, had already confessed it dogmatically in 447, even before Rome, in 451, at the Council of Chalcedon, came to recognize and receive the symbol of 381. The use of this formula in the creed was gradually admitted into the Latin liturgy between the 8th and 11th centuries. The introduction of the philoquy into the Nicene Creed by the Latin liturgy constitutes, moreover, even today, a point of disagreement with the Orthodox churches. At the outset of the Eastern tradition, excuse me, at the outset, the Eastern tradition expresses the Father's character as first origin of the Spirit. By confessing the Spirit as He who proceeds from the Father, it affirms that He comes from the Father through the Son. The Western tradition expresses first the consubstantial communion between Father and Son by saying that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Philically. It says this legitimately and with good reason. For the eternal order of the divine persons in their consubstantial communion implies that the Father, as the principle without principle, is the first origin of the Spirit, but also that as Father of the only Son, He is with the Son, the single principle from which the Holy Spirit proceeds. This legitimate complementarity, provided it does not become rigid, does not affect the identity of faith in the reality of the same mystery confessed. All right. That was really tough sledding right there. The best that I can say is, those last two paragraphs are trying to say, basically, that there are two different ways of expressing an inexpressible mystery. Okay? Saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, or from the Father through the Son. Um, that last sentence says it does not affect the identity of the faith. 
in the reality of the mystery. The reality of the Trinity is what the reality of the Trinity is. How we express it doesn't change the reality. The Latin Church expresses it in the formula without the, with the filiqui, and the Eastern Church expresses it in a form without the filiqui. Am I making any sense? It's two slightly different ways. I think it's a fairly fine theological point. Although one time I was having a conversation with an Orthodox priest, and he said, it's really, really important. <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, it really doesn't change anything. You know, I mean, in practicality, I don't know how it affects me at all. You know, but um, he seemed to think it was a really big deal. And... Um, Let's move on because I don't have any, any great wisdom anymore to, to expound on that. Three, the Holy Trinity and the teaching of the faith. The formation of the Trinitarian dogma. From the beginning, the revealed truth of the Holy Trinity has been at the very root of the church's living faith, principally by means of baptism. It is true. When, when we baptize children or when we baptize anybody, that's one of the times where we really emphasize the Trinity. You know, I mean, explicitly. It finds its expression in the rule of baptismal faith, formulated in the preaching, catechesis, and prayer of the church. Yeah. When, when you're asked those questions... We really break it down. Do you believe in the Father? I do. Do you believe in the Son? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I do. We really nail that Trinity uh, doctrine in the sacrament of baptism. We don't do so much so in other sacraments, not so explicitly. Such formulations are already found in the apostolic writings, such as this salutation take up, taken up in the Eucharistic liturgy. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we're very familiar with that, aren't we? We've heard that greeting so many times, which is a Trinitarian greeting. Paragraph 250. During the first centuries, the church sought to clarify its Trinitarian faith, both to deepen its own understanding of the faith and to defend it against the errors that were deforming it. This clarification was the work of the early councils, aided by the theological work of the church fathers and sustained by the Christian people's sense of the faith. In order to articulate the dogma of the Trinity, the church had to develop its own terminology with the help of certain notions of philosophical origin, substance, person, or hypostasis, relation, and so on. The, these philosophical terms had to be defined. In doing this, she did not submit the faith to human wisdom, but gave a new and unprecedented meaning to these terms, which from then on would be used to signify an ineffable mystery, infinitely beyond all that we can humanly understand. The church uses, first of all, the term substance, rendered also at times by essence or nature, to designate the divine being in its unity. Secondly, the term person or hypostasis to designate the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the real distinction among them. And third, 
the term relation to designate the fact that their distinction lies in the relationship of each to the others. And so we talk about subs the nature of God, we talk about the persons of God, and we talk about the relationship among the three persons of the Trinity. The Dogma of the Holy Trinity, paragraph 253. The Trinity is one. We do not confess three gods, but one God in three persons. The consubstantial Trinity. As we change the, the, how we read the creed in English a few years back, we used to say, one in being with the Father. And now we say, consubstantial with the Father. So, one in being, one in nature, one in substance, one in essence. We're talking about the nature of the thing, okay? And, and so, there are three distinct persons. As I say in, in class, person is, answers the question, who is this? Nature answers the question, what is this? Okay, so nature and person are two different things. Jesus, by the way, has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, but he's only one person. Okay, there's only one Jesus. He's one person with two distinct natures. So back to the, the truth. The Trinity is one. We do not confess three gods, but one God in three persons, the consubstantial Trinity. The divine persons do not share the one divinity among themselves, but each of them is God, whole and entire. Okay? So we've had this before. Um, it would be the heresy of partiality. It's not like you have a pie, a pumpkin pie, you cut into three pieces. It's all pumpkin pie, it's the same substance, but you got three, one, one third of God. No, they're not one third of God. They are all completely and entirely God. <laughs> okay? They, 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 we're not talking about sharing the divinity. Each one is God, whole and entire. The Father is that which the Son is. The Son is that which the Father is. The Father and the Son, that which the Holy Spirit is. That is, by nature, one God. In the words of the Fourth Lateran Council from the year 1215, quote, each of the persons is that supreme reality, namely the divine substance, essence, or nature. Paragraph 254. The divine persons are really distinct from one another. God is one, but not solitary. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not simply names designating modalities of the divine being, for they are really distinct from one another. Okay, modalism. Uh, we've, I think we've had this before too. Um, the same person can be a father, he can be a husband, and he can be a son, you know. Um, I am all three of those things. And we're not saying that God is simply um, expressed in this mode here, and he's expressed in that mode there, that the one God is expressed in three different modes of acting or being. No, there are actually three distinct persons. Okay, three distinct persons, not one person acting in three different 
modes of being. He is not the Father who is the Son, nor is the Son He who is the Father, nor is the Holy Spirit He who is the Father or the Son. They are distinct from one another in their relations of origin. It is the Father who generates, the Son who is begotten, and the Holy Spirit who proceeds. The divine unity is triune. The divine persons are relative to one another. Because it does not divide the divine unity, the real distinction of the persons from one another resides solely in the relationships which relate them to one another. In the relational names of the persons, the Father is related to the Son, the Son to the Father, and the Holy Spirit to both. While they are called three persons in view of their relations, we believe in one nature or substance. Indeed, everything in them is one where there is no opposition of relationship. Because of that unity, the Father is holy in the Son and holy in the Holy Spirit. The Son is holy in the Father and holy in the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is holy in the Father and holy in the Son. Paragraph 256. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, also called the theologian, Entrust this summary of Trinitarian faith to the catechumens of Constantinople. Above all, guard for me this great deposit of faith for which I live and fight, which I want to take with me as a companion, and which makes me bear all evils and despise all pleasures. I mean the profession of faith in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I entrust it to you today. By it I am, going, I am soon going to plunge you into water and raise you up from it. I give it to you as the companion and patron of your whole life. I give you but one divinity and power, existing one in three, and containing the three in a distinct way. Divinity without disparity of substance or nature without superior degree that raises up, or inferior degree that casts down. The infinite co-naturality of three infinities. Each person considered in himself is entirely God. The three considered together. I have not even begun to think of unity when the Trinity bathes me in its splendor. I have not even begun to think of the Trinity when unity grasps me. That was a statement from uh, St. Gregory Nazianzus. The Divine Works and the Trinitarian Missions. Paragraph 257. O blessed light, O Trinity, and first unity. God is eternal blessedness, undying life, unfading light. God is love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God freely wills to communicate the glory of His blessed life. Such is the plan of His loving kindness, conceived by the Father before the foundation of the world in His beloved Son. He destined us in love to be His sons and to be conformed to the image of His Son through the spirit of sonship. This plan is a grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, stemming immediately from Trinitarian love. It unfolds in the work of creation, the whole history of salvation after the fall, and the missions of the Son and the Spirit, which are continued in the missions of the church. The whole divine economy is the common work of the three divine persons. For as the Trinity has only one and the same nature, so too does it have only one and the same operation. 
The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not three principles of creation, but one principle. However, each divine person performs the common work according to his unique personal property. Thus the church confesses, following the New Testament, one God and Father from whom all things are, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things are, and one Holy Spirit in whom all things are. It is above all the divine missions of the Son's incarnation and the gift of the Holy Spirit that shows forth the properties of the divine persons. Being a work at once common and personal, the whole divine economy makes known both what is proper to the divine persons and their one divine nature. Hence, the whole Christian life is a communion with each of the divine persons, without in any way separating them. Everyone who glorifies the Father does, through, does so through the Son in the Holy Spirit. Everyone who follows Christ does so because the Father draws him and the Spirit moves him. The ultimate end of the whole divine economy is the entry of God's creatures into the perfect unity of the Blessed Trinity. You know, that's what we hope, that's what our great hope is. Someday we will be in heaven with God and will be caught up into the love of God. It's something beyond, as St. Paul said, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no, nor has it entered the mind of man. But God is prepared for those who love Him. I mean, we can't even begin to understand the, the, the essence of, of God's love between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we hope to be in the midst of that for all eternity. That's going to be pretty cool. We finish off... Uh, no... We still have one more sentence to go. But even now we are called to be a dwelling for the Most Holy Trinity. If a man loves me, says the Lord, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. We end with a prayer from Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity. O oh my God, Trinity whom I adore, Help me forget myself entirely, so to establish myself in you, unmovable and peaceful as if my soul were already in eternity. May nothing be able to trouble my peace or make me leave you, O my unchanging God. But may each minute bring me more deeply into your mystery. Grant my soul peace. Make it your heaven your beloved dwelling, and the place of your rest. May I never abandon you there, but may I be there whole and entire, completely vigilant in my faith, entirely adoring, and wholly given over to your creative action. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord, for our class tonight. This mystery of the Trinity, Lord, we cannot grasp it and understand it completely, but help us be like little children, Lord, and put our faith in you, to believe in you, to believe things that our minds cannot completely grasp, but we believe it because you have revealed yourself to us through your most beloved Son, Jesus. So come Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, live in us and help us to follow you each and every day of our life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.